Good morning. Well, good afternoon, actually, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, I'm dialing in from East Melbourne, not far from the banks of Birrarung, which means ever flowing in the Woi Wurrung language of the Wurundjeri clans. I acknowledge that I stand on their country and pay my respects to their cultures and their elders past, present and future. Um, I'll just go straight to um, introducing our presenter today, Hamish Clark, um, who is the leader of a project on optimising cost-effective prescribed burning as part of the New South Wales Bushfire Risk Management Research Hub. He's been instrumental in building the Prescribed Burning Atlas that was launched by the CRC in July. At the launch webinar gives details on the research methods used to derive the atlas, but today Hamish is going to give us some detailed instructions on how you can use the atlas to help guide your decision making in your prescribed burning programs. So without further ado, I'll just hand over to you Hamish. Thanks very much Deb and to everyone for uh, joining today. Uh, it's great to be here, thanks to the Centre um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm sitting the Darragan uh, Gundungara peoples. Um, so a warning, if you did come to the launch, I did talk a bit about uh, the Atlas. We did talk a lot about the science too. And as Deb mentioned, the science isn't my focus today. I'm gonna to give you a tour of the Atlas. But if you've seen that, um, there's gonna be a fair bit of repetition. So um, understand if you wanna drop out, otherwise I'd, I'd love for those who wanna stick around, um, I'll talk about uh, the layout of the site and some individual uh, things, you know, kind of features and functions of the Atlas. I'll just share my screen. Um, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the other members of the team. Um, uh, so there's uh, Ross Bradstock, who's recently been made Emeritus uh, Professor at Wollongong. Um, Owen Price, who's now the Director of the Centre for Environmental Risk Management and Bushfires at Wollongong. Um, they're both part of the New South Wales Bushfire Risk Management Research Hub as well, which I'm part of as well as our collaborators at Western Sydney, um, Matthias Bohr, and the University of Melbourne, Trent Penman, Brett Sarulis, and Tony Rawlins. Uh, for those of you into Twitter, you can check out some handles there. And of course, um, a big thanks to our supporting institutions, um, particularly the CRC for supporting the project and the, the broader CRC program. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I'll give you a very brief background on uh, the, the project, uh, but I'd like to spend most of my time taking you through the site and some of the examples of what you can do. Um, and very happy to take questions. Um, so what is the Prescribed Burning Atlas? It's a decision support tool for prescribed burning risk assessment. What does that mean? Uh, decision support, it's not gonna make your decisions for you. Hopefully it will help. It will add information and some evidence to help you make decisions. Um, uh, and it's specifically about uh, trying to tally up the risks um, when we do prescribed burning. Um, it's really about comparing different options. So um, uh, that's one of the fundamental things we were trying to do is to be able to create a level playing field, to be able to compare different options uh, in the same place, but also different, the same options in different places. Uh, we're interested in risk mitigation across the portfolio of values. So um, not just, you know, the area burnt by bushfire, but also, um, property loss, infrastructure damage, and environmental impact. Uh, the focus of the Atlas um, is on relative differences. Um, we'd have all the kind of original raw results, but um, uh, it's probably uh, more confidence in the relative changes than the absolute values. And I think it's probably more informative too, uh, when you're talking about prescribed burning to ask in relation to say a zero treatment case. So that's, that's how it's set up, but all of those raw values are are sitting under the hood there and you can access them if anyone's interested in finding out more about them. Um, the Atlas is very much uh, in tune with the idea of risk mitigation and not el elimination. So there's a residual risk in, in basically all scenarios. There's always, no matter how much treatment or where you do it, there's still some risk left over. I realise residual risk uh, means different things to different people. Uh, just making sure. Uh, I'll continue, sorry. <laughs> um, so I realise there are different technical definitions of residual risk. Um, in the Atlas, uh, it's basically the difference between a zero treatment, do nothing option, and the, the particular case you're looking at. Um, 
Uh, the ALIS also includes um, information about the cost effectiveness of different options. So we've had a crack at putting a dollar value on not just bushfire impacts on house loss or infrastructure, um, but the cost of conducting prescribed burning itself. Uh, and importantly, we've got um, climate change in there. Uh, climate change can affect bushfire risk through many different pathways, uh, you know, fuel, fuel moisture, ignition, weather. Um, and it's not just bushfires, it's prescribed burning that can be affected. Um, our ability to conduct it may be different in the future, for example. Um, so we haven't included every single pathway, but we've included a really important one, which is the effects of, of weather on, on fires and, and wildfire risk or bushfire risk. Um, so that's included in the Atlas too, and I'll give you an example about that. Um, before I dive in, it's also worth uh, emphasising what the Atlas isn't, so you don't walk away disappointed, or at least you're warned if you do. Um, so the Atlas is not a tactical tool, it's a strategic tool. Um, we don't have information at the level of individual burn blocks and individual assets. We're not going to tell you burn this patch here and not that patch there, or burn at this time and not that time. Uh, that's not what it's set up to do. Uh, it's set up to give you strategic level insights um, at the landscape scale. Uh, and for, for us and for our case study landscapes, that means around 200,000 hectares. Now there's an asterisk there because uh, we don't have that yet. Um, the information from the project, um, you know, the large number of simulations that we've done and uh, the various post-processing means that information is actually sitting there available to us. Um, and we've already had some conversations with end users who are interested in, in doing a proper analysis of that. Uh, there's nothing planned yet. Um, if you're interested, please get in touch with us. Um, uh, it's definitely possible. But right now, as it stands, the Atlas is very much a strategic tool and not a tactical tool. Uh, and it's also very important to uh, emphasise it's, it's not the last word on uh, the values we're looking at uh, and the costs. Okay, there's various things that haven't been included, whether it's um, cultural heritage, um, smoke emissions and health costs, uh, as well as the way that these things are modelled. So, excuse me, we've tried to use published uh, relationships where available that link bushfire uh, behaviour and uh, area burnt and things like that to actual loss of, of assets and the things that we look at. Uh, but there's always room to improve those and it's very much a modular uh, setup that we can uh, you know, update or test alternatives if we want. <clears throat> um, finally, uh, it's not a comprehensive accounting of all the costs and benefits of bushfire management. Uh, we're still a fair way off from that, but I think it's, it's a really important milestone with the Atlas that where we can kind of see the outlines of that now. We can see, okay, what might it look like to have a, a comprehensive, you know, national account of, of treatment, of risk mitigation across as many different uh, values as possible and, you know, costs for those and, and, and recognition of, of the various values that you can't easily put a cost on as well. Um, I think that's, that would be a good place to get to, but we're not there yet. Um, so to the Atlas. Uh, this is what you see when you go to the homepage, uh, prescribedburnatlas.science. I'll share the URL uh, at the end. Um, actually, it's not what you see. What you first see uh, is a login screen or a registration screen. So we're asking you, uh, and this was in, in consultation with the end users, uh, for everyone who wants to use the Atlas to register. So I realise it's a bit of a pain signing up. Uh, we won't do anything with your details. We won't spam you, um, but uh, that's the way that the Atlas set up now. So please register, um, please take the time. Um, we hope you find it worth it. So once you've registered, this is what you see, map of Southern Australia and the various case study landscapes. Um, a quick tour of the site before we get into the, the kind of juicier bits. So the about page, um, if you're ever wanting to know a little bit more background about the project, uh, how it was developed, what it's about, click on that one. Uh, the team, uh, it's doubtful, but you can find out more about myself and some of the other team members uh, on this tab. Uh, we've got an FAQ section, which has already grown since we first started it. Um, hopefully the most obvious questions you have about the Alice are, are answered there, uh, but um, we're always um, open to adding more as well. So frequently asked questions uh, about um, you know, the, the why and wherefore of the Atlas. 
Uh, there's a help section. We're working on some short videos. There's one there and we're putting together the other ones at the moment. They'll be there before too long. Um, so if you're the kind of person who wants to, rather than just dive in and point and click, uh, get a bit of a guide or if you get stuck uh, and you want to go back to the guide, that's where to find them. And contact us. Um, we really, really appreciate it and encourage you to contact us if you have any questions, any comments, good or bad. Um, uh, this whole project has been developed in close collaboration with end users and you know it looks nothing like it would if it had just been developed by researchers on its own uh, and so we want to continue that uh, and we are there's a few uh, side and extension projects which i'll mention later um, trying to get more input uh, from end users and fire managers uh, the last um, uh, bigger one is the publications so for those of you who are interested in the science we've got a list of publications some of them are kind of flagged graphically at the top uh, but there's a much longer list at the bottom. Uh, so um, the paper by Sarula et al, kind of two thirds of the way down the screen there, that was the first one which probably published the methodology in detail and results from a couple of case study landscapes. That's in the International Journal of Wildland Fire. I'm happy to make these available to anyone who can't access them, so just get in touch with me. Um, we've also got a few other publications uh, off the back of the project, as well as kind of connected to and related to the project. Uh, as well as the various reporting um, for the CRC and some presentations. Sometimes presentation presentations can be a bit more uh, accessible than um, kind of dry journal articles. Um, so to each their own. I will just mention the uh, the paper in the middle there, a uh, new decision support tool for prescribed burning risk assessment. Uh, I was going to say it's your go-to kind of um, uh, high-level summary of the project. So we tried to, to sum that up exactly what it does and why, what it can and can't do. Um, we can make that one available to you. Uh, however, there's also just been released a hazard note by the CRC. So it's going to buy with that. They've kind of pitched to slightly different angles. The hazard note's a bit more of a magazine style uh, description, um, but both of them are, are accessible. Um, so whether it's you or if you're trying to introduce other people to it or describe it to them, I'd recommend uh, this uh, new decision support tool uh, paper or the hazard note, which if any of you subscribe to the CRC will be uh, filling up your inbox as we speak. Uh, so the last uh, section uh, of the, uh, the kind of getting around is the study areas. That's the most interesting one, I think, for everyone. That's the whole uh, reason for it. Um, here's another view, uh, satellite view. So you can toggle between satellite and map view. Uh, so pick a study area and what do you see? Let's pick one. Uh, here's our case study landscape in Tasmania, centered on the Hobart region. We've got some background information uh, about the region. Uh, for Tasmania, we're lucky enough to have even a bit of background information on the prescribed burning regime, thanks to some of the work they've done there and published. Um, we don't have that for all the case study landscapes. If you've got that, feel free to share it with us and we can pop it up there. Um, but this is just a bit of a background of the case study landscape. Then you can actually see the landscape itself main features here are our ignition points and our burn blocks. So all of the treatable vegetation is divided into edge and landscape blocks. Edge blocks are the darker green and the landscape are the lighter green. The edge blocks are those that are close to people and settlements. They tend to be smaller, tends to cost more uh, to treat there. Um, and as you see, the effectiveness of burning you know, sometimes is quite different between the edge and the landscape. The landscape blocks tend to be larger, more continuous patches of native, native vegetation. Uh, and so each uh, landscape, you can, you can take a look at exactly where we've done the simulations and, and where, where the results are for. The ignitions I'll just quickly mention, uh, I said I wouldn't talk about the science, but just quickly, um, they're based on an ignition likelihood model. So it's not an even uh, kind of gridded set of ignitions across the landscape. They're focused on areas based on, on published studies of where ignitions are more likely. Um, so here's the main kind of results, if you like, the main tool part of it. Um, there's many more, but this is the kind of the, the building block, if you like. Uh, we call it a matrix plot. Um, it's basically an XY plot showing uh, a change in um, risk to a particular value under different treatment scenarios. So uh, that's a Forgive me, I've got some other people passing through the house shortly, so if things get too noisy, I'll move. So we have uh, treatment on the x-axis, which is the landscape. 
and treatment on the y-axis, which is the edge. Um, the, they're just circled there. Um, so you can hold one of them fixed and move along, or you can hold the other one fixed. Um, our baseline scenario is zero treatment, so the do nothing option. Um, uh, we define the risk level for that as one. Um, and in this case, and indeed in, in most of the cases for most of the values, uh, your risk goes down, the residual risk goes down when you do more treatment and you're getting a varying amount of risk reduction depending on uh, how much treatment you do and where you do it. Just as an example, I've highlighted two boxes here. We've got one where we're burning at 3% of the edge and one where we're, and we're burning at 1% of the landscape. And we've got another one where we flip those two. We're burning at 1% of the edge and 3% of the landscape. Uh, and as you can see, similar but not identical results. So a slightly bigger reduction in risk in this landscape if we weight our burning slightly towards the landscape rather than the edge. Still getting uh, a reduction in risk. Uh, and in this case, it's for um, the risk of area burnt by bushfire. So again, just a quick step back, um, the, the kind of core um, simulation setup is a simulated wildfire or bushfire um, and the different conditions are different levels of, of, of treatment. So we're not simulating the prescribed burning, the prescribed burning is kind of baked in. Uh, what we're simulating is the wildfire. And here we have the risk of the wildfire or the area burnt by bushfire under these different treatment scenarios. And you can see there that, you know, if you jack it up to 15% of the landscape and 15% of the edge, uh, you're still getting um, some risk, uh, but it drops down to you know well below 50% of the do nothing option. Uh, so there's a drop down menu there, uh, and you can click on any of these values. So fire area we just looked at, house loss, life loss, power loss is the length of power line affected um, by fire um, under a certain intensity. Uh, road loss is the length of road affected, and TFI burnt is our environmental indicator. Uh, so uh, it's definitely not the only indicator available. We're working on some others, which I'll, I'll mention uh, in a little while. Um, but this one relates to vegetation, which is sensitive to the frequency of being burnt. So some vegetation uh, needs to be burnt, some vegetation can't be burnt, and um, uh, assignments have been made to different vegetation types for how much is too much or how much is too little. So in this case, our flag is if vegetation is being burnt too much. So being burnt below its minimum tolerable fire interval. Um, and that can have, you know, basically you know, serious consequences for the vegetation. Uh, so um, we don't burn it below the tolerable fire interval with our prescribed burning treatment, um, but we can get close to it such that a wildfire could potentially take you over the edge. And that explains some of the results that we see. Um, there's a lot to take in on this one, but it's another um, one of the core kind of building blocks of the results. This is a, a bit of a spider plot, spider web plot. Um, and instead of showing one of the values, uh, fire area, we're showing uh, all six. Okay, so at 12 o'clock, we've got fire area. Uh, about two o'clock, we've got house loss. Uh, four o'clock is life loss. Six o'clock is uh, length of road affected. Uh, eight o'clock is length of power line damaged and 10 o'clock is our area burnt below minimum tolerable, tolerable fire interval. So there are our values. And then uh, the size of the polygon indicates the amount of risk. And in particular, at any of those vertices, any of those uh, corners, how far out you are tells you the level. Okay, so our zero treatment case uh, is our yellow line. Uh, no burning at the edge, no burning at the landscape. And our default risk is one or 100% for all of the values. When we increase treatment, you can see the, sorry, just my daughter, sorry. Uh, when we increase treatment, you can see that the uh, polygon gets smaller. So there's a reduction in risk and it's not the same for the different values. Uh, in particular, the lighter green one, which is our um, more at the landscape, less at the edge, gives you a greater reduction in area burnt by bushfire. Whereas it actually gives you a slightly higher risk residual risk for house loss. Um, TFI in all three cases that we've looked at here um, is pretty similar. There's not much difference for this particular landscape for those three scenarios. Um, so that's our spider plot. 
gives you a snapshot across all of the different um, values at the same time. Um, and just as I was saying, for fire area in particular, you can see there that we have our residual risk level of one, uh, for no treatment. And then when we do treatment, uh, the two different scenarios are giving slightly different levels of residual risk. Um, so moving on to one of the other features of the prescribed burning atlas, um, one of the, the key kind of feedbacks that we got from end users was this idea of twiddling the knobs, um, holding one thing constant and changing another. Uh, so in this case, what we're doing is we're holding uh, the edge treatment constant at 2%. So that matrix plot that I mentioned, we're basically fixing it an entire row uh, and looking across there. So what happens if we hold edge treatment even at 2% and then vary landscape treatment? So the, the blue bars are telling you the response of risk, in this case to house loss, as we increase landscape treatment, but keeping that edge treatment fixed. Um, and you can obviously do that for uh, any of the variables and the levels of treatment. So when we switch it to landscape, now we're holding the kind of vertical column fixed and you can see a similar trajectory when you hold it uh, fixed at 2% of the landscape and vary the edge, but not identical. So if I just toggle back and forth, you can see that um, you end up with a slightly higher level of risk when you're um, holding the landscape fixed than you do. Um, so this allows you to just fix one of them and look at the change. Uh, and again, you can apply that to any of the values and set whichever level of treatment you want. Uh, I mentioned climate change. So we've got a little button there for toggling on climate change effects. Um, and the way we've shown this, we've, we've taken a, a model ensemble. So 12 different climate change models, um, uh, which basically factor in a few different um, emissions, sorry, not one emission scenario, but a few different models. Uh, in particular, they're selected for the uh, spanning of different climate futures. Uh, unfortunately, all the projected climate futures are warmer, but some of them are a bit wetter, some of them are a bit drier. So we basically sampled from the space and then we've asked what's the implication in, for risk from those different scenarios. So instead of plotting all 12, we've just got two lines. We've got a worst case scenario in red and the best case scenario in green. Um, so that's just uh, highlighted there. What you can see is the green kind of best case scenario is, is pretty similar to the current levels. Um, so under some uh, warming scenarios, the risk reduction available from prescribed burning uh, is essentially unchanged. However, there are also scenarios where the risk is in, uh, considerably increased. Um, to give you an example of kind of what that means, um, let's look at this. Um, so again, we've, we've fixed landscape treatment at 2%. We're now varying the amount of the edge. At 1% of edge treatment, we get a risk uh, reduction of about 30%. So a residual risk of 0.7 or 70%. Um, under the worst climate change scenario, we're having to do somewhere between 3 and 5% at the edge to get the same level of risk reduction uh, that we could have achieved um, in the present day under only 1%. So it gives you a sense of the potential decrease in effectiveness of prescribed burning under severe weather conditions uh, of which the bushfire might be burning. Uh, the last major part of the Atlas is our cost effectiveness tool. So I mentioned we've had a crack at assigning costs to the various elements of um, uh, wildfire impacts and prescribed burning treatment. Uh, the layout of this is similar to the one we were just looking at where you can hold one of the, the rows or columns fixed and vary and look at the other. Uh, there's a bit going on here, so I'll try and step you through it. Uh, we break it up into different costs. So um, the cost of environmental impacts, infrastructure damage, life loss. We've also got the cost of treatment, uh, which I'll highlight in a second. Uh, in red, the red line is our least cost option. Um, uh, so in this case, we can see that holding it fixed at 2% of the land at the edge uh, doesn't get you quite to your least cost option, no matter how much landscape burning you do. So it's another configuration which gets you there. Um, importantly, I think you can separate out the costs of treatment from the impact costs. So in yellow and light green are our costs of uh, landscape and edge treatment. So in this case, you can see the yellow one increases because we're gradually doing more landscape treatment. So by the time we get to 15% of the landscape, 
you're spending quite a lot of money to treat that much every year. Uh, the uh, edge costs though are fixed because we've held it fixed at 2%. Uh, and then below that, we have our various impact costs. Um, and so you can see in some situations, uh, I guess this is what we're getting at when we talk about a decision support tool, um, it may be more important to reduce the cost for some things than others. Some, some costs may be more bearable than others. And so we're trying to make that explicit here. Uh, this particular messy graph gives you everything, but you can also click on the drop down and select a particular one if you're just interested in infrastructure or, or loss of life, things like that. Um, so that's basically uh, the end of the tour for now. Um, uh, in the pipeline, we're looking at going beyond the case study areas. So I mentioned, uh, you click on a case study. Uh, so what we're working on having into the Atlas pretty soon actually in the next couple of months is essentially a gridded or interpolated version where you can click anywhere in the landscape and get a sense of what the risk reduction is based on the relationships uh, that we've, we've uh, seen uh, for the landscapes that we have done. Uh, we're also adding in uh, new landscapes. So as part of the CRC's 2020-2021 um, funding, um, we're doing some work with South Australia, uh, looking at Kangaroo Island, as well as asking some more questions about the Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges case study landscape. Um, and we're constantly making tweaks and changes in response to end user feedback. So again, would really appreciate uh, hearing from you, whether you're a fire manager or anyone interested in prescribed burning or fire or land management. Um, please register. Please take a look at the different case studies, uh, explore the different treatment options. Uh, let us know uh, if something's not working or if something seems odd. Uh, this is very much a modeling exercise, um, you know, informed by a lot of empirical evidence, but nonetheless, there are some interesting or unusual results. So um, uh, we'd be happy to discuss any of them with you. Uh, and lastly, um, importantly, I think, um, you know, we wanna work with you to, to make it as useful for you as possible. So if it's one of us coming into your workplace virtually, or God forbid, even in person, if the, the new year permits, or uh, providing uh, written guidance or um, just general phone call, whatever it is, whatever we can do to help you use it, um, we're really keen to do that. Um, so before I hand over back to Deb for any questions or comments, um, uh, some of the main take home messages from the Prescribed Burning Atlas project, um, there's no one size fits all solution to prescribed burning. Uh, so we're seeing uh, definitely patterns, patterns across you know, certain vegetation types or population densities, but also really interesting and um, important differences. Um, and so the whole kind of, you know, the subtitle of our project has been moving from hectares to tailor-made solutions. You know, can we do better than just a pure hectare-based target? Can we actually tailor our, our prescribed burning treatment and bushfire management more generally to the local conditions? Um, and that's, you know, segues into the second point there, which is these local conditions um, play a really important role. And it'll be no surprise to, to people working locally, um, but it's important that our, our science and modeling um, reflects that. Um, so all of these local factors, configuration of assets and vegetation uh, influence the results. Uh, and just as there's no one size fits all solution to say risk reduction, neither is there a one size fits all to, to cost reduction or most cost effective treatments. They vary by region too. I'll just give you an example here. Um, uh, under this particular scenario in the Blue Mountains landscape, you're generally getting uh, a decrease in the overall cost with increasing treatment in our southeast Queensland kind of hinterland, um, it's, it's the opposite. We're increasing treatment um, more than compensates for any decrease in the costs due to impacts of bushfires. Um, so our prescribed burning uh, you know, solutions or strategies need to be tailored. Uh, and the last point, which I think is, is, a, is a pretty important one too, is that climate change tends to reduce prescribed burning effectiveness essentially a greater investment to achieve the same results. Thanks very much for listening and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hamish. That's great to see. And I know when um, I first saw this presented a couple of years ago at a research forum, you only had two or three of the uh, areas on the map. And so it's great to see it expanding into other areas of Australia. And I'm sure there's people like it, I'm not sure if there's anyone from WA on, but it'd be nice to see some stuff happening over yes, there as well. We would love to do that. Yeah. Yep. Um, so just I've got a couple of questions here for you. The first one's from Peter, 
uh, and it, what is the assumed fire intensity used to determine burning interval? Uh, so I think we have, I don't think we have a threshold. I have to double check that, I'm sorry. I'll have to look in, into our um, methods. I'd be happy to get your contact details and get back to you if you like. But off the top of my head, I think it's any fire affecting, um, you know, this particular sensitive vegetation. Um, our infrastructure and some of the other values um, are sensitive to the intensity of, of the simulated fire, but I don't think the, um, the, the environmental one, the area burnt below minimum TFI is. Um, I didn't actually ex expand on it, but I will just quickly mention that uh, through the New South Wales Bushfire Risk Management Research Hub, we're looking at some new and improved environmental indicators. Um, I mean, this is really the start, it's not the finish. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, to follow up with you offline if you like to give you more detail on that. Thanks for the question. Great. And a question from Chris, how would La Nina or El Nino play into this? Would it directly affect risk or does it just play into potential ignition points in the mapping layers? Yeah, interesting question. Um, so basically what we've tried to do is um, build in the historical record of weather observations. Um, so I think we're looking at something like a 30 year climatology um, for our case study landscapes. And then we essentially build a table of the probability of different FFDI category thresholds. Um, and so they're absolute in a sense, we don't have year to year variation. Um, they will have picked up some major La Nina years and they will have picked up some major El Nino years. Um, and so the risk uh, kind of result that we get integrates across all of them. That's another little asterisk I'll, I'll mention. There's been some studies which uh, just pick, say, a, you know, a catastrophic day or a very high fire danger day. We include all the weather, so it integrates across all of them um, to represent a kind of annualised risk estimate. Um, so if there were a change, for example, in, in the conditions, um, then it would actually influence um, the risk. I mean, and, and that depends on the relationship between um, ENSO and, and the different you know, study areas. Some of them, the, the correlations are much stronger than others. Um, but yeah, that's probably a step beyond what we can provide on the Atlas at the moment. And then you, there's factors like the Indian Ocean Dipole, which, yeah. you know, if that interacts with El, um, El Nino, then you've got those really, really, really dry summers. So, yeah. That's right. So we're limited uh, in a way by how well climate models capture those things. Um, but certainly the climate change ensemble that we've used um, was basically best practice. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it has some representation of the various um, modes of variation, the IOD and ENSA. Uh, and so it's to the extent that they influence future FFDI, then they are actually incorporated in these results. Yep. Um, and another question from Peter. So I think you might be hearing from him later on, but uh, in terms of area affected by wildfire with the various treatments, how do you factor in the effectiveness of deployment and use of firefighting resources? Yep, excellent question. So suppression is not in there at the moment. Um, we did discuss this with, um, with our end users, but we decided not to include it. Um, there's been some work done looking at the effectiveness of suppression uh, in like a, a fire behaviour simulation environment. So I think it's possible to maybe make a few educated guesses about it, but at the moment, these are not, are not um, knocked down quickly. There's no strong suppression resources thrown at these. So you could think of them uh, as a worst case scenario, uh, except that uh, the prescribed burning is implemented essentially as a reset of your fuel level. Uh, whereas we all know that prescribed burning generally doesn't you know, vaporize all the vegetation. Uh, so that counterbalances it somewhat. Uh, and probably exaggerates the amount of uh, reduction in fuel from prescribed burning. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you more offline. Um, some of my colleagues have, have done quite a lot on suppression too. So it's a, it's a really important part of it. Yep. Um, a question here from Emily. How do you integrate climate and weather data to estimate fire risk? Do you use the worst case scenario for daily relative humidity, temperature, wind speed combination? Or did you conduct long-term time series analysis on climate variables to define the risk? Uh, thanks for the question, Emily. So we use long-term uh, records, um, but we're running our simulations under essentially under different 
conditions. Excuse me. So if you like, we'll run our simulations under a, a very low FFDI scenario, um, all the way up to catastrophic, unless we're in a case study landscape where that's never been observed and then we won't actually include that. So we'll run it under all the, the different FFDI thresholds. Um, but then the key thing is we'll actually tune, and this happens in the kind of post-processing and, and Bayesian decision network stage, we'll adjust the probability based on what's been observed there. So if you're only getting one severe day every 10 years, well then we're not gonna weight that equally to our very, very high days, which are happening much more frequently. So we're trying to factor in the full range of weather uh, and based on what's actually been observed in, in those different case study landscapes. It's essentially, you know, Bureau of Meteorology station data. Um, the questions keep rolling. I've got a question here from Matt. A great presentation, but one question, how are the costs estimated for uh, lots of life? Uh, yes, thanks, Matt. Good question. Um, so it's an insurance industry. I think it's, a, it's one of those actuarial things where there's a, you know, it's horrible to say, but people put a, a number on it. I think it's something like $4.2 million per life, but I, I should have these numbers at my fingertips. I don't, sorry. I can easily find it for you though. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's based on, you know, published uh, literature. Uh, we can, you can certainly take different numbers and run with them, but that's what we've used. Yep. Um, a question for, from Mitchell. Uh, what um, have you tried different house loss models across the landscape? Um, so we initially used two different ones. Um, one was, I think, a very simple uh, function. Oh, wait, no, I'm thinking of life loss, sorry. We used two different life loss ones, um, but the websites only used the one based on a paper by Harris and others. The house loss model that we've used uh, is just one, again, based on a publication. We haven't tested different ones. One of the things that I heard from um, some fire managers last year in the terrible season that we had was that the house loss, even though it was obviously, you know, terrible uh, and massive, um, was actually lower than what we might have expected with some models. So um, it would be really interesting to expand that and look at other models um, and you know, we've, we've set this up with the express intention of being able to update our numbers. Um, it's probably just not going to be at this stage uh, a function in the atlas where you can kind of pick your model. But it would be great to get to that point where you can swap in different models, different costs, and then test the implications of that. Yeah, it would be um, interesting to see, like, I'm sure that the cost of a house in the Blue Mountains is going to be slightly different to a cost of a house in the Adelaide Hills. And yes. So you can get yeah, we... the house cost based on your area. Yes. Yeah, we purposefully used a single number for, for house loss just because we kind of didn't want to get into that valuing houses more in some areas than others. But, you know, the fact is, as you say, they are valued differently. Um, so that's also possible to adjust. Um, as a paper that um, uh, Trent um, led looking specifically at the cost effectiveness of the different solutions. So I'm happy to share that with anyone who's interested in, in seeing some more, some really interesting results there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just checking and it looks like that's all the questions. Um, so I would just uh, like to thank you today, Hamish, and let everybody know that this uh, video will actually go up on YouTube. So it'll be a reference video for anyone that wants to go back and, and have a look at how to use the Atlas. The, the link to the Atlas is in the chat box, as well as the link to the oh, note for the, that the CRC released today. Yes, you can find it. There's there's the link again for anyone curious. Yeah. Brightburnatlas.science. And also, if you are interested in watching the launch video, uh, it is available on the CRC uh, YouTube website, along with a Q, an, another extended Q and A that Hamish did after that webinar. So that's all available um, for anyone that's interested in some of that more detailed um, background into the research. So. Uh, so yes, a, round, a virtual round of applause as we do these days for Hamish and I'd like to thank you all for attending today and um, happy Christmas and New Year and we'll see you next year, hopefully in person. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Deb, Thanks. for coming in. Bye. Bye for now.